Welcome to my presentation on the I.O. Sim library, which you can use for testing and simulating concurrent code. The goal that we have is to design distributed systems and also to test them. So let's talk about testing first. What does it mean to test some program? Well, you can view the program as some function that takes some inputs and some outputs. And then testing for correctness means that you have some inputs and you check that the outputs are the ones that you expect, right? Um, now, when I say inputs and outputs, I mean this in a very general sense. So this could either be just ordinary values and your program could be a function that produces some output values. It could also mean some initial state and then your program transforms that state to some final state. And testing in both of these cases means that you take some known input or initial state, you let your program run, and then you check whether the output is as expected or the final state. Now, basically, there's two ways that you can go about that. Um, the most straightforward way is to explicitly construct manually some initial state or some input for which you know the output um, or the final state and then run your program and, and check whether it's correct, right? And that is that is straightforward, as long as you have some way of knowing what, what the correct output is besides your program itself. But it is quite cumbersome because um, manually specifying all those inputs, you, you typically do that for like a few cases, but not for too many cases because it's, it's just some work. And furthermore, um, it's basically um, yeah, impossible to check for edge cases that you are not aware about, because um, not aware of, because you're manually constructing the input values. And so if there are some edge cases, then either you think of them and, and you know that there are edge cases that you need to test, and then that's fine, or they're not. And, and then by manually constructing them, if, if you're not aware of them, then you, you probably will not, um, will not include them. So there is a better way of doing things, um, which is property-based testing, um, as first implemented in Haskell in, in QuickCheck. And there the strategy is that you randomly generate some sample input. So you write functions called generators that can generate you arbitrary input to your program. And then, because in, in general, you will not know like what, what the expected outcome is, but you will have some idea of some properties that, that uh, your program should observe. So something like in a bookkeeping system, money isn't destroyed, or something that um, sorting functions don't change the number of elements in a list, and these kind of general properties that don't test like the whole, um, your whole program for correctness. But um, if you if you think of enough properties, then um, you you can you can like check many aspects of your program, and you can do so without knowing exactly what the output should be for any given input, because you want to randomly sample the input. Basically, you, you specify those properties, and then you can satisfy that those properties are satisfied for arbitrary input. And that's quite, quite a powerful concept, because you don't have to think of all the special edge cases. You have to write your generators in a way that they like um, more or less exhaustively um, probe your your parameter space. Um, but that is easier than thinking of every individual edge case. Furthermore, there is a, another technique called shrinking, um, which basically says if you have generated like your, your test data and you found some, some um, example that violates one of your properties, then you know you found a bug, right? But you don't know like what exactly the bug is. You just know that like for, for this arbitrary complex input data, some property is violated. Shrinking now allows you to systematically go to simpler input data and then find the minimal counterexample. And then once you have like a minimal counterexample, it's it's most of the time it's very easy to to like see wh where where the where the problem problem lies. So that helps you enormously not only finding bugs. 
but only in um, correcting them. Unfortunately, concurrent and distributed systems are very hard and they are hard to design. And the difficulty is that unless in a sequential program where you can basically follow a linear thread of reasoning and, and like follow every state of the program from one step to the other, in a concurrent program, it's much more complicated because you have multiple threads of execution and there can be interactions between those. So you can have some shared state and then you can't follow just one of those threads of execution, but you have to follow multiple and their interactions. And because of those shared state and because the timing of those, the scheduling is not deterministic, um, you can get like you can get different results depending on how far how fast each of those threads execute. So it's quite hard to, to design concurrent programs. It's even harder to test them because you need to have like you need to have those those different threads running. If they're running on different machines, you have to provision different machines. And then also observing like the total state of the program is more difficult if it's running on multiple machines. And this non-determinism is actually very hard. It's very, very hard for testing because some of those bugs, they don't happen in every run, right? They, they only happen if the, the scheduling between those threads is just right. And so that makes it very hard to consistently detect bugs. And it also makes shrinking. So the process of simplifying your input data to find a minimal um, counterexample impossible. Because if you simplify your test data and the bug goes away, you never know whether that is actually a consequence of just the, the shrinking itself or whether it's just by chance that the, the scheduling of those threads was a bit um, different. So what can we do in order to make those um, concurrent and distributed programs more tractable? Well, we can try to reduce the complexity via simulations. And that's that's like the, the, the content of this presentation. For example, let's take a communication channel, which is like a, a simple primitive of a distributed program. You have two computers and one of them can send some information. So they take some data of type A and um, send that to the other computer and the other computer can receive it, right? Can, can take that from the environment. Um, you can simulate those just via a mutable variable, right? So you can define this data type, you can define this channel of type A, and it has two functions. It has a send function, where you send, fun send, send some data, and it has a receive, which collects some data. And like the simplest way of, of um, simulating that would be to um, instantiate such a channel by um, creating an empty mutable variable. And then the send just puts some data into that variable and the receive takes it. Of course, that's not, that's not particularly realistic. And you can, you can add more realism to those simulations, to the simulated channel. For example, this this uh, this, this uh, mutable variable is only a one-place buffer, right? Once you have put something, once you have sent one message, the channel blocks until the other side has read it, and that's not typically what what happens in a network, right? So you can use a bounded queue instead. Also, um, that's basically instantaneous communication, right? You put something into the variable, and at the same time, then the other computer can can read it, and so um, you can. In order to make it more interesting and more realistic, you can model the time delay between those two computers. Um, and one way of modeling that is to say, okay, you have these two computers, they have like a networking device and then some cable between them, some distance of the cable. And then if you want to send a message, the first step is like putting that message through the, through the networking device, serializing it. And then that networking device will block for an amount of time that's proportional to the message size and basically given by its, by its bandwidth, by like how much data can process per second. And then once the, the message is sent, it propagates through the network and that delay is basically given by, by the distance. It's just like the, the speed of light that it takes through, through the wire. And on the other, end, the other end, you have the deserialization where the message arrives and then the networking interface again 
deserializes the, the message, blocks while it does that, and then um, you can receive that message. And um, by that way, by, by like um, having those blocking stages, you can also simulate like sending multiple multiple messages through the same channel and you will you will see that there will be contention so sending sending like two messages of a given size then takes double the time or like if 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 um if you send one after the other has already been started to to be serialized then the delay is a bit less so that's a quite a it's a simple model but it gives you already some of those effects that you have in, in sending messages. Of course, you can go even further with adding realism. And like the ultimate thing is building one of those um, channels using an actual network communication, right? But um, why would you want to do that? Because the, the idea of doing simulation is to reduce complexity. And the moment you, you build a channel using the actual network connection, you have the same complexity as before, right? So why would you want to do that? And the answer is, if you do that, you can treat the real world just as a special case of a simulation. And that in turn allows you to write just one code base and then run the same code either in production using the channel that is built on top of real network communication or in simulation. And then you can use the, the simulation for your tests, where it's easier to observe um, effects and it's easier to run them, it's quicker to run them. And you can run the same code that you have tested in simulation in production. And um, yeah, that, that's, that's the idea of, of this IOSIM library. So, so far, <clears throat> if we're doing it like that, um, the advantages of testing stuff in simulation is that it's easier to run because it's all on one computer. You can observe the global state. But this this last thing that was that was hard about these concurrent programs, that's still there, right? You still have multiple threads. You have this mutable variable and you have different threads accessing that. So you don't have determinism and you can't do shrinking and you can't find minimal counterexamples. And it's still you still have that problem with the intermittent test failures. And that is where the IOSIM library helps with. So the, the IOSIM library, it's a, it's a drop-in replacement for deterministically simulating like large parts of the of IO in Haskell. And it covers synchronous and asynchronous exceptions. It covers concurrency in the style of the, the base library and the async library. It covers software transactional memory. And it has a simulation of, um, of progressing time. Um, it has some event log tracing so that you can analyze your runs and, and like find exactly what's going wrong. You can find that library not yet on Hackage, so it's it's part of the repository which holds the networking stack of, of Cardano. You can find it at this link. And you can find like the, the IO sim library, which is the the simulator itself. And you can also find um, a package called IO classes. Now it's IO classes. IO classes is basically a type class based um, wrapper around the IO sim library that basically gives you an interface that allows you to switch between production code and simulated code. So it has these, these monads like monad thread, which um, encapsulates something where you can have threads. Um, so you have like thread IDs, you can label a thread. You have then building on top of that you have the monad fork where you can fork off additional threads and there's all these these, these functions that you know from io like forking another thread um, throwing an exception to another thread killing a thread these kind of things <clears throat> and then the instance for io is right straightforward right you just fork io is just fork io from the io library and similarly with all these other methods. But in addition to that, you also have instances for the simulator. And by that, you can write your code, your client code, against these type classes. And then when you um, instantiate your program, for testing, you can use the simulated I.O. And for running production, you can use actual I.O. And that then allows you to run the same user code in the simulation for tests 
and in production, which is really what you want, right? You want to test the code that you're also running. With that deterministic simulation, you can efficiently run quick check tests and do the shrinking to get those minimal counterexamples that tell you what's really going on, which is really nice for debugging. The simulated time allows you to run the tests really, really quickly. And so you can, if, if you want to, you can have basically years of simulated time running in your CI tests on, on every pull request if you want, which is um, really great because you want to find like these, these rare um, these rare test phase failures. The tracing mechanism allows you to analyze what, what, hap what happens and you can, you can tune like the detail, you can tune the verbosity of that. You can also do things like fault injection, right? You can simulate disk failures, you can simulate disconnects, which of course you can also do when you're, when you're testing things in an actual network, you can also like, um, yeah, cut some connections from time to time. But um, yeah, doing it in that framework is really convenient and you can, you can like tune the rate for these failures in order to, to find those those errors that you would also stumble upon in production after a year of running the system, like probably at night time when you're asleep and when the system is under load. And um, yeah, so that's, that's a really nice thing. We've used that to test um, some of the, or like the, the concurrent code in Cardano. We've used it to test the network stack and the, the consensus stack. And um, if you look at the repository and at the issues, we have this label for IO SIM discovered bugs. And if you look at that, there's things like fix the asynchronous exception handling, right? Which is really hard to stumble upon in, in testing because you need to have asynchronous exceptions happening in the first place. And then, um, yeah, or, or things like um, resource handling and masking and unmasking. These, these are things that are like um, really obscure, but of course they, they can happen in production. And if you if you find those those um, tests, those those errors that you wouldn't find by just running things in production, it's really useful. <clears throat> so much for testing. Next, uh, let's go to um, prototyping things. So this is about you have a specification of something that you want to implement, and before implementing it for real. You want to like um, <clears throat> do a prototype in order to see how it works, how efficient it runs, and, and these kind of things, and, and basically validate your design, both functionally and in terms of performance. The example that we're covering here is the Hydra Head Protocol, which is a protocol for, um, for scaling up transactions that are being processed on a blockchain system. Because on blockchains, um, you make this, this trade-off between decentralization and scalability, where basically on the blockchain, every transaction is, um, is validated by every node in the system, um, which, which basically prevents any one party from, from, from cheating and from getting control of the system. But it prevents you from just adding more computers in order to process more transactions because they're all supposed to check everything, right? So in these layer two solutions, <clears throat> what you do is that you process some of those transactions off chain. So you take away some, some money from the chain and then you have like a smaller group of computers that um, basically send transactions between themselves and agree on some final state that is then committed back to the chain. And so instead of like posting all those transactions to the chain and having them verified by all the nodes in the system, you get some local consensus on the resulting state after those transactions and only that is committed back. And in the case of a Hydra head, that is basically um, the, the way of getting consensus is that if one node wants to um, post a transaction, it sends it to all the other nodes collects um, like signatures back in order for those nodes to acknowledge those transactions and then wraps them up in like one object that contains all those signatures, sends them again to all of them. And then once that with that object that basically says all the nodes agree that that transaction should be valid, then any node can basically go and, and 
decommit that and, and post that resulting state back to the chain. Now, we want to um, simulate such a network of node and we want to make a few observations. In particular, we are interested in the performance of the system. And that means we want to know the settlement time. So how long does it take from sending the transactions to the peer to getting that object that says, okay, everyone has acknowledged that. And we want to know the throughput, like how many transactions per second can the system handle? Of course, that depends on a number of parameters, right? It depends on, on the networking infrastructure. So it depends on the bandwidth that these networking interfaces have. It depends on the transaction size because that basically tells you how much bandwidth you need. It depends on the distance between, so the geographical setup of those nodes. And also it depends on like the, the concurrency in the sense of how many transactions are those nodes willing to have in flight at any given point in time. Because if you have more transactions in flight, you can amortize some of the latency by having by sending basically more messages before you want wait for a reply. And then of course it also depends on like the, the CPU and processing power of all those nodes <clears throat> because they need to do um, transaction validation and perform and validate signatures. Um, we have like looked at how to simulate those those um, those communication channels already. And then we also need to look at how do we simulate like those those things that take time on the CPU, like um, transaction validation. For that, we introduce um, a data type called delayed computation of type A, which contains the result of the computation and it contains the time that it takes to compute the result. With that data type, we can we can define a monad that tells us how to do like those kind of delayed computations, how to chain them together. So for instance, if you if you want to have a co delayed computation that depends on the result of another delayed computation, like here, you have some delayed computation and you want to put that into a, a function, another delayed computation f, then uh, you can do that by basically looking at the result of putting x into f and the time that it takes to do that second step in the calculation and then the de overall delayed computation just is the result of that second computation and it takes as much time as those two things together and similarly for for those other for like for for just um doing one computation after the other without using the result and for doing delayed computations that don't depend on one another <clears throat> um, then you can you can run those within any any monad that basically has a method a way of delaying for some for some time by just doing that delay and then returning that that result. And um, such a monad is also implemented in the IO sim and IO classes. So that's the monad timer. And then for IO, that's just a simple thread delay. And for the simulation monad. That is basically just adding some number to an internal counter. With that, we can now simulate a node in that Hydra um, system. So we basically have, have two communication channels. We have one for receiving messages and we have one for sending messages, right? And those handle basically all the, the communication with, with all the other nodes. In particular, when there's multiple messages coming in at the same time, the networking interface will like block on the first one and only um, start processing the other one once that is finished. Then you have like a, a queue of incoming messages. You have um, like an event handler for, for, for dealing with all those protocol messages. And then, for example, if you're asked for a signature, you do a delayed computation, you produce the signature, and then send put that message with the signature into a queue. And on the other end of the queue, you have again a networking interface that takes these um, takes these messages that are prepared one by one and sends them to the rest of the network. Right? So that's that's the idea. And then again, like you, you have those those networking interfaces 
blocking upon serialization or deserialization. You have just a, basically a, like um, sending it. Um, the, the time that it takes is, depends on, on the distance. And then you, you can like you can set up a simulation where you fix the geographical location of all the nodes. You fix the bandwidth of each of those network interfaces, and and then you also say like what's what's the message size, how many of those um, transactions are the nodes willing to have um, run in in uh, concurrently. And then from that you can, you can run these simulations. And you can you can create graphs like and that and that's like only based on the simulation before you start the effort of actually implementing that for real. And um, if if you look at the results here, so you have different panels for like um, the the number of transactions that the nodes have in flight at, at a certain time, and then you're on the x-axis, you vary the the bandwidth of the networking interfaces. And then here you see the transaction throughput, like how many messages, how many transactions can you handle per second. And then you see if you have like insufficient bandwidth, you're limited by that. And if you increase the bandwidth, at some point you're saturated. And then you are in the region where basically you are limited by the, the round trip time between different nodes. Now, if you increase the concurrency, basically you, you, you try to have multiple transactions validated concurrently, you can amortize the latency between between those of, of the round trip time and you get a higher throughput. But at some point, increasing the concurrence even further doesn't allow you, you to increase the throughput. And that's because then you, are, you start being limited by the processing time of each node for like creating those um, signatures and validating them and validating the transactions. And all of those effects you you can see in the, in that in that simulation, which is um, yeah fairly simple to to set up. You can also um, see like trade offs that you have. If you look at the the lower row, um, you see the the um, the confirmation time for a single transaction. So that's the time from sending a transaction to the peer nodes and getting back that that object that basically contains the the signatures from all the other nodes with which you are able to then to then basically post it back to the chain whenever you want it. And you see again that increasing bandwidth um, like decreases the confirmation time. But you see that if you increase the concurrency, the confirmation time actually goes up. And also here the, the spread goes up. And um, if you think about it, that's that that is not that surprising, right? Because if you are trying to get multiple transactions validated at the same time or get consensus on multiple transactions at the same time, then the chances of like the networking interface being busy at the moment that you send a transaction, those go up, right? If you're only, if you're only processing one transaction at a time, then the network interface is free most of the time. If you're trying to send multiple at a time, then you are bound to, to like run to run into a blocked device sooner or later and that gets worse if you if you increase the the concurrency and actually here um because of the log scale it looks like the spread would be um lower here but um, that's that's only an artifact of the log scale here so it's also this the spread that goes up right yeah <clears throat> and and in particular you you see like these are like um um, so, so in, in the simulations, we haven't. So we could have introduced like a an explicit randomization of like how long it takes to to send one transaction through the network, but we haven't done that here. So all the spread that you see here is just because of the like the the, the blocking and, and these contention effects that we have in, in the simulations. So it's it's quite a yeah. It's it's a it's not it's it's a fairly simple simulation but it's already um giving you um like uh yeah so some of those interesting effects yeah uh to conclude um you can use that iosim library to test concurrent code and simulation which allows you to test much faster so you can get more efficient effic effective test time in a given like wall clock time and that allows you to to run much more tests in your, in your ci 
Um, you can also do the, the kind of fold injection that really makes those tests more valuable and it's deterministic so you can get those minimal counterexamples via shrinking. One thing I haven't mentioned is that um, recently we also added um, or um, yeah, we, we had John Hughes um, suggest and, and also implement a mechanism for um, reordering some of the um, some of the scheduling in order to like not have just one ordering of those of those threads, but to to find like reorderings of of threads that are racing against each other, and then also find some permutations in the in the scheduler in order to just cover more, but not like um, try to find every permutation which would be exhaustive. Um, yeah, and with that you can you can like um, have the benefits of um, of um, running your tests in simulation, but having still the same code run in production with those wrappers, with those type class wrappers. Um, and you can also write that, that, that library to just write quick prototypes. And because of the, the timing that you have in the simulation uh, monad, you can also um, predict the performance and get some performance characteristic, not only like the functional correctness of, of your algorithm, before you do the full implementation. Um, yeah, thank you. Do you have any questions about that?